had an epiphany one day that I am truly living proof that early detection saves lives. So let's start a little bit about me. My name's Lainey. I live in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and I'm 38 years old. I live with a rare genetic disorder called the Framini syndrome. That means is that cancer is a permanent fixture in my life and my body is more susceptible to developing a cancer. I have been fortunate enough to survive adrenal cancer, breast cancer, thyroid cancer, and melanoma, and multiple reoccurrences in between. So um, my first cancer diagnosis was actually uh, when I was 18 months old. So obviously I really don't men remember many of those, um, but I was, um, I had adrenal, adrenal carcinoma. So um, that was my first cancer diagnosis. And um, I was diagnosed with stage two breast cancer at 24 years old. And then when I got the melanoma, I, you know, I started to really just question, I'm like, Some, this again, something's not right. I'm 25 years old. I've had three cancers. Like, this is crazy. So age 26 comes along and I'm getting my one year follow-up for my breast cancer. I, I was doing PET scans at the time and, um, they did my whole body, my, the whole body PET scan. And the next day the doctor calls and he's like, um, there's a really big mass in your neck and, um, it's spread to your chest. I'm like it, it ended up being thyroid cancer. So I did the chemotherapy first for breast cancer. And then, um, I, I, I don't think I was on anything. I was always on Herceptin though. Um, till like, I think it was like a, a certain amount of time after my treatment, I was on Herceptin. Then when I, the thyroid cancer, I had um, what's called a RAI radioactive iodine. Um, so I was in the hospital for like three days that never overlapped with the breast cancer. Cause I wasn't on anything. Um, and then there was a point where I would think I was on like an oral chemo. Cause I had like, I did have some intermittent, um, metastatic reoccurrence for the breast cancer and my lymph nodes just in this area and in my collarbone and my armpit. Um, so those were treated really some with oral chemo and, um, they did, they did stop my Herceptin and the Tigrip that I was on initially and another drug called Zolota. So I was off of it. I, I want to say for like eight months, and this lymph node showed positive and I was at MD Anderson at the time. So I saw a breast oncologist there and they're like, you know, we want to take an aggressive approach approach with this, these two lymph nodes, because, you know, it's concerning that your cancer came back and you were on a chemotherapy and then, you know, you stopped it. So it's like, something's not right. And so they did do aggressive chemotherapy for, for that. And then the only change for that in 2012, I had radiation which in its own was a little risky um, because of Lee syndrome and radiation. Um, but uh, thank God I have not had a reoccurrence of breast cancer since 2012. So the radiation really, it helped, um, but it led to also another cancer. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I, it's crazy, but they knew, like we knew that it could cause another cancer. So the, the doctors like aggressively watched me every three months, I would get ultra, whole body MRIs and ultrasounds. And I want to say it was about three years to the day. They caught like a three tiny, teeny spots in my chest wall of sarcoma in 2015, um, through an ultrasound. And, um, again, back to early detection, like I'm, I'm on top of my health. They caught it. I ended up having to do chemo again, a different type, super aggressive in 2015. Um, so, but in between all of those, I've always been on Herceptin. That's a drug I've been on. I mean, and I'm still on it to this day. So, um, I've been on it since 2012, um, consistently since then every 21 days, uh, and a, and a, and a pill called Tycurb. Um, Tycurb though, I did stop when I started my sarcoma, when I had my sarcoma, um, journey, cause it, it obviously contradicted like some of the meds. So, um, I did stop that, but they always added Herceptin to any type of chemotherapy I was going through. Well, nausea was the worst. Um, I think that that was terrible. Um, I, I did a lot of like lemon ice cubes. I like made my own like ice cubes with lemon drops in them. Um, I think every treatment was different. I mean, 
I, I do, I think new lasta was terrible for me. A lot of people don't have, you know, that, but I think just exercising, like walking, um, just making sure you're moving, hydrating. I mean, dairy was something that I loved eating. It was so weird. Like each, each, um, each chemotherapy, I think I had different cravings. So I always say I, 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 it was like, I guess being pregnant, you know, it was like I had all these crazy weird cravings and like, <laughs> I just like, like I was craving feta cheese at one point. Like, this is so bizarre. Like, but yeah, no, I think really just, um, mind over matter. Right. And the thing that really stunk about that is I was about eight weeks away from getting married. Um, and I was so bummed because I, my joke, my running joke was with my husband was, you know, we were, we were together seven years before we got engaged. Like you cannot propose to me until my hair is long. Like it was like a whole thing. And then it turned out I had to lose my hair like four weeks before my wedding. I think that that was the hardest thing for me, um, was losing my hair the first time. Um, my hair was, I was, I, I don't want to say it was vain, but my hair was like my favorite part about myself, right? Like that was just my thing. Um, and you know, I had a wig and it grew back. Right. And then I, like I mentioned earlier that, you know, I told my husband, he can't propose to me until my hair is long. And then I had to lose my hair. Well, I actually had my wedding photographer, uh, document my head being shaved right before my wedding, which was so amazing. And um, she did an amazing blog post about it. And um, it kind of went viral at the time, which was kind of crazy. And I was known as the cancer fighting bride. Um, but, you know, I think something and that that moment, actually, that was probably the hardest time losing my hair because I, I was, I never envisioned being a bride, but it was not the bride I envisioned to be, right? So I didn't look like myself, you know, I was on the steroids for chemotherapy and I, I just, I didn't feel like myself. And I look back at the pictures and I'm just like, oh God, I, I didn't look like who I was, but my husband's like, you're here and that's all that matters. Um, and I think that that's something to always remember is, you know, never lose sight of, you know, what is going on, especially for people who are brides, right? Like it really kind of shifted life into perspective that like your wedding isn't about the flowers and about, you know, what everybody's wearing and all that drama that goes along with it, right? It's about the people that are surrounding you in that room and the person you're marrying. And it's all about love and family. And but, um, and then when I had to lose my hair for the third time, I'm just like, okay, whatever. At this point, it is what it is. The third time, I'm just like, you know what? This time I'm going to try, I don't want to shave it. Like, I want to kind of see what it's like for it to come out. <laughs> like, I was just like, I'm like, let's experiment this. And then I ended up shaving it. But like, you know, it's just, it's each time was different and it sucks, but your hair grows back. And, you know, I think that that's something just to always remember. And I will tell you, like, that's one, you got to find the positive in everything, right? Like not having to do your hair every day and just slap it on a wig was the best thing ever. Like, there you go. You know, you got to find the positive in everything. <laughs> so, um, I, um, I, I, I tell people I live my life in three month increments. And basically what that means is I get my scans every three months and I tell myself if there's something there, it's only three months old. That's, that's how I process it. And I think that that's something now that I live with every day, right? Like I have this gene and um, this gene is, it, my body is susceptible to developing cancer. Like that's literally what it is. Um, so I tell people I live my life in three month increments. As, and what that means is, is I go to Houston every three months and I get full body MRIs. Just waiting to get my chest ultrasound. Got my cute robe on. And the most important part, a warm blanket. And I get ultrasounds um, and, you know, I see my doctors there and it really helps me. Like it helps me process everything. I'm very fortunate. And listen, I, I always put a disclaimer, like everybody is different. Every, everybody's cancer journey is different, right? So never compare yourself to someone else because somebody might be listening to this and say, oh, well, I have Leifermini syndrome and I need to get, I, that means I need to get my whole body MRIs everything up three months up. I think every single person is their own patient. And that's why I love going to MD Anderson is because they treat me like their own. I'm, I'm not like the patient who was in there before or the patient who was in there after. I, it, it, and of course I get skin anxiety. I'm human. Like, you know, I, I live with that. Like I'm going actually next week to Houston and you know, I'm, I'm, I have that anxiousness, but you know, I think in the moment, if there is something there, of course I freak out like any human would. And then I just tell myself it's, it's only three months old. So that's really where I'm at with everything. Um, and you know, it's just, it's my life. So, you know, did I know that I was going to probably get another cancer from radiation? Yeah. Is there still a chance that I could 
get another cancer from that radiation? Absolutely. So, you know, it's just, it's the life I live and, and I've chosen to really just take it and turn it into my purpose and not dwell on it. Like there's, there's, it's out of my control. It's out of my control. Well, all I can say is number one is God bless our caregivers because I being, being on the other side, like I said, I'm, I'm a hypochondriac and I'm, and I'm neurotic. So like I was crazy. Like, my, and it, it's funny, like being on the reverse end, um, because you know, i I was never in that seat. Like, I, I just feel like my whole family, like everybody, like my husband is a saint. Like he, you know, he sometimes has to remind me like, you know, like you got to stay on top of your health. I mean, I'm always on top of my health, but just, you know, he just reminds me certain things and he's so, he's so incredible too. Cause you know, not everybody's that lucky. And I think, you know, I just have such an amazing support system and you know, it, it takes a village. It really, like I couldn't do this on my own. And, um, you know, my parents, thank God, are doing both doing great. My dad had prostate cancer. Um, and, you know, thank God my parents are really diligent about their health, too, just given what I've gone through, which I'm also so fortunate about. Um, and my mom actually had um, a rare blood cancer called myelofibrosis. And she actually ended up having a bone marrow transplant. Um, and she, thank God, is doing amazing. Um, she had a donor, uh, an, uh, an anonymous donor who she fortunately got to meet a few few years ago virtually, but um, she had an anonymous donor who was a 12 out of 12 match. And, you know, that process that she went through was eye-opening and, and it was scary. And I mean, she's, I can see where I get my strength from, for my parents. Like it just, you know, I, I tell people, like, like I said, I work at the American Cancer Society. Um, it's, this is our purpose in life. And we, we are a family who rallies together to really just make a difference. And I'm so grateful. I have those, my parents as my, you know, examples, and they would probably say that I'm their example, but, you know, I think we all kind of feed off of each other's energy and we're, we're just very lucky that, you know, we've had um, great outcomes and I have a lot of cancer in my family too. So it's crazy, but I always say I have cancer and longevity. So my mom's parents, unfortunately passed away from cancer, but my dad's parents lived till 94 and 96. So there we go. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, it's a good situation to be in, right? I have cancer and longevity. I, I think it's so important to trust your instincts, right? I think you need to, you know, doctors are amazing. It's okay to f have another opinion. I think that's so important. I think you need to, you need to feel comfortable with your physician. That's so important, right? And I think, um, you know, making sure if something is not right, you know your body best. You live in the skin you're in. You you know your body the best. And if if uh, a physician is not willing to act on it, on it, um, move on. That's it. You know. I also think something I would tell people, like if somebody calls me and they're newly diagnosed, you know, don't get too many opinions, right? I think you can drive yourself crazy with opinions. Um, so really, you know, kind of narrow down to who do you feel the most comfortable with, right? Um, I think that that's something I really strive to tell people because, you know, you could, you could get so many opinions and then by the time you find somebody that you really like, it's too late, right? So I think that that's definitely a lesson I learned. I always get my paperwork. I think it's very important to get everything. I always ask for my blood work. I always ask for my, like, it, listen, we, we, we live in a virtual world these days, Right but have everything in hand and make yourself a file folder and just like keep everything as annoying as it sounds, or even just like scan it in, get the paper, scan it in, throw it away. Just vis visibly see them. Even if you look at it and it's in your my chart, just once they give you your results, always take them and look at them. So you understand what's going on and make sure that that's exactly what you see and what they see. And, you know, doctors are very busy people. And like, I think a lot of, we're all humans, right? We all make mistakes. It's okay to make, ask questions, right? Like, I think that it's so important. Always ask questions. If there's something you're like a little confused about, ask a question, right? I had an incident a few, a few months back when I was in Houston and I had blood work and my BUN um, was elevated. And um, the doctors weren't concerned. It was elevated like two points, right? It was nothing crazy. But I asked, you know, I was, I, it just, it was like in a red. It was like, it didn't look right. And it was higher than before. And I asked the question. So I think, you know, never be afraid to ask a question. Um, I think 
we're, like I said, we're all human and things, you know, things can get overlooked. And sometimes, sometimes most of the time they're nothing. Right. But it just shows you're doing your due diligence. And the other thing is too, aside from like paperwork and stuff, like if you feel something that's not right, or, you know, something wasn't there that you were born with, or just something looks abnormal, go and even if you've never been diagnosed with cancer, right, go to your primary care physician, um, you know, or go to your oncologist, like, if something's not right, like, again, you know, your body best. So you need to speak up and say something. It's so important. From when I was diagnosed in 2008 till now, everything has changed immensely, um, which is which is so incredible. And you know, I think there's people taking pills right now for cancer and not having to lose their hair and and just things, you know, not having as many side effects. Um, I think that that's just so incredible. And I think if that can be any um, hope, right, and 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 push for those to get screened, I think that that's so important because you know, there's so much out there. Um, and I think it's very just the most important thing is to catch it early and not ignore any any type of symptoms. Even if you don't have symptoms, if you just feel something, don't ignore it. Like I said, I think my purpose is to help others. And I think that that has really helped me through my journey. I think, you know, really I've, I've turned my diagnosis into my purpose. And I always say I haven't, you know, as much as people think it might define who I am, I let it empower who I am. Um, and it's, it's really just helped me get through things and just at the end of the day realize life could be so much worse. And um, I'm so grateful that, you know, I've been able to just shift everything and shift my mind. And, um, you know, listen, it's not always easy. Like cancer is not sunshine and rainbows. And I know that. Um, but I think for me, I just really hope that, you know, my story helps others and um, really just not let let people be scared of cancer because I think a lot of times people delay getting screened or delay getting something because they're scared they're going to get cancer. I say this to you because you know your body best. If you feel something, you need to say something. Early detection saves lives. And the only person who can save you is you. And it's so important not to delay any of your screenings and stay on top of your, your routine screenings year after year because it's really, you know, a testament to why I'm here today is, you know, early detection. It saved my life.